Google ads and I just immediately loved it. I love the challenge of it, that it's constantly changing. I think the, um, the, the thing that really flipped me over into it was that I couldn't figure it out, that it was very difficult to understand and just such a challenge. And I said, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to do this. I want to do something that's challenging, takes my advertising experience, my econ degree, um, everything that I know, um, and how to reach people and technology. So that's sort of how I ended up there. And, um, I have my business, uh, for about 14 years. Um, I, I love it. I work with, uh, directly with clients across different industries. Um, over the years, I also, as you mentioned, I write uh, for Search Engine Journal. I just had an article um, published on um, uh, PPC Hero. And um, yeah, just living the dream. Keeping busy. Yeah. So what did you, what did you do before you kind of got involved in digital marketing? What, 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 what was your sort of journey before you got to this point? I was actually working um, as a like a communication specialist. Basically, I worked on websites. I wrote content, um, e-commerce sites, uh, did multimedia type of stuff. So it was still within digital, and that's where I learned about websites. Yeah, it's funny. You I was- know, ba- basic a- base- basic HTML from back in the day. I had a book, and I you know studied it to understand um, what it was all about. So always in advertising, always in marketing. And um, so it was an easy transition to. You mentioned those AOL discs. I remember like, apart from having like literally one in every drawer in the house, right? I used to, I was, again, when when the internet first started, I mean, I got my first computer. I had uh, Windows 3.1. I got that. And it was just like mind blowing how great this thing was, right? So I used to do coding in basic and, and, um, you know, like really, really super, super simple, simple stuff long before computers kind of like that could talk to other computers existed. I mean, although they existed, but they're big mainframes. Um, But when, kind of the internet sort of first came out probably I'm trying to think maybe 92 93 something like that I, I got I start bought my first computer when uh 3.1 came out um which was again mind-blowing got onto the internet used the AOL disc and I used mm-hmm. to run up like so like every quarter I would have the most ridiculously expensive phone bill from running mm-hmm. up like crazy bills right of of you know for just from kind of watching what was going on. I used Netscape Navigator 1.0 and, you know, there were so many things which, which, you know, again, when you kind of look back at it now, you go, wow, that, that stuff seems ro- so, so basic. I mean, like the the, op- the whole operating system for Windows 3.1 was on like a couple of floppy disks, right? And, you, you know, you're looking like now nothing, you, you know, you don't really buy any sort of software, whereas disks or CDs or anything like that, it's just like literally everything's kind of cloud-based. Um and, and it, you know, you mentioned like obviously Google ads, right? I, I, I mean, as much as, yes, it was probably, um, you know, difficult at the time, right? But I think when you kind of look at what the original Google ads was compared to what we have now, it's like so dramatically different, right? I always kind of say like, even though it's, it, it's still called Google ads, right? The complexity of the current land fra- landscape is so much more complicated than it was back in the day, right? Which then kind of begs the question. I mean, I, I always kind of ask this of agency uh, owners like yourself, right? The the, the kind of d- the challenges of people doing things in-house versus using an agency, right? Versus going directly to, you know, to Google or what have you, right? But I just wondered kind of what your, what your thoughts were as far as, you know, agency versus in-house, say. Agency versus in-house. I think... It depends, you know, it depends on what your marketing department looks like. Uh, People that work with me usually have a smaller marketing department, so they can't have a dedicated person doing PPC ads or paid media ads because you really, I mean, you can just do it, but really it takes somebody who's focused on it, who is an expert, um, a subject matter expert, and that's keeping up with the trends. And there's a lot that goes a lot that goes into it, and there's a lot on the line for advertisers. So 
you know, if it's a, if it's an, um, you know, a company that can't afford to have the resources to hire somebody and have somebody in house who's dedicated to it, then I definitely, it's something that they need to outsource if they want that, that special, um, you know, that, those, those, that special expertise. But I think the, the core, I think the, the thing is for me is that they have to want it. They have to want to do it. And um, so it's hard to convince somebody who thinks that they can do it in house or wants to do it in house. And they, they're really set on that to convince them otherwise. And, you know, so they're, it, but they, you know, they might also be able to hire, you know, an amazing expert. So that's where I see. Yeah. I mean, so, so again, so, so with bad decisions with Jim Banks, the premise of the, of the, the podcast is to <laughs> enable us to kind of help educate and, and bring on the next generation of digital marketers, right. To learn from the experiences, good and bad of people like yourself and me, um, in terms of, you know, their, their journey in, in the industry to date. If you were, if you, again, if you were to go back and, and advise 20 year younger Lisa, you know, to kind of, uh, get involved in this. What what sort of advice would you give yourself back then as to you know what what sort of what sort of things to do at school? You know, like what 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 education oh. to get that type of thing. Um, I'd be interested to know what you thought. What would I advise someone? So someone now, I think it's. I think that it's it's really important to. Um, have the marketing fundamentals and advertising fundamentals. So this is, um, I see this all the time, actually, not knowing what positioning is, not knowing what branding is. So I think that is super important for someone um, of any generation to have that nailed down if that's not their specialty, if they're, if they're moving into it. Um, definitely technology and understanding the different pieces of technology that connect into it. Because even if you're focused on just working in the Google ads platform, the Microsoft ads platform, any of them, you still uh, need to understand what a cookie is or how the, what load time means. You need to be able to look at um, general, uh, you know, web analytics and understand what those metrics mean. You don't need to be, you know, as, 10 on a scale of one to 10, but you need to be, you know, solid five in order to be able to do your job. So those are two um, really big things. And I think, um, you know, having, having a passion for how those things converge, right? So advertising and technology, you're advertising on the internet, you're doing it a lot of different ways. It's not just restricted to search. I mean, there's a, it seems like an unlimited way of reaching people now. So, um, and then I think those learning the platforms and learning the buttons to push will fall into place. If you have that basic, um, that basis for, um, being open and able to learn quickly how to implement. So what, I mean, one of the, the challenges I, I always had, back a, f a few years. So, I mean, I've been doing this 20, 25 years. So one of the challenges I always had was, right, that, that in, in some respects, like a, a generalist ppc -er, um, would, would say, I'll work with any, any company of any size in any location, right, in any vertical. Um, and, and it became really apparent to me, like that was a bad decision because I realized the, the, the companies that I really didn't want to work with. It wasn't that I didn't believe in them. It wasn't that I think they were good. I just realized I didn't like startups, right? Because I found them quite arrogant. A lot of the, the people I was talking to because they had kind of ideas way above their station, right? They were brand new businesses, but they were thinking they were like a fortune 500 company. And I'm like, you're not that. I mean, you, you might want to get aspired to be that, but you're not that now. Right. So, so I, I kind of said, okay, well, I only work with businesses that have a floor of, of a million dollars a year in sales. Right. So that kind of cuts out a lot of startups because they don't have that, that sort of uh, run rate. Um, but I also kind of found that I was working with a lot of um, industries, right. Where, you know, again, there was heavy regulation, you know, compliance and stuff that you needed kind of hoops you needed to jump through. Like it was constantly getting, you know, Google ads, 
declined and disapproved and, you know, you got to verify this, do this, do that, right? So again, I kind of said, well, let's just do e-commerce because, you know, in most cases, most e-commerce businesses are fairly vanilla, fairly straightforward, you know, unless they're selling, you know, particular adult products or something, you know, there's generally, a, you know, there's no problems or issues with um, with running Google ads or Microsoft ads or paid social Facebook ads or whatever. Um how do you find, because I'm, I'm curious, because because you're more of a generalist, you kind of, you know, you, you cite on your your uh, profile that you kind of like work with lots of businesses, lots of verticals. How do you do that sort of screening? How do you actually screen which clients might be a good fit for you to work with and which ones are not? That's a great question. Um, I do have listed the different types of clients that I have worked with, but I don't work with them all at once. So one of those qualifying um, considerations would be what does my client portfolio look like? There are, um, I was just making some notes here. There are several different industries where they're kind of tricky, right? So um, legal, healthcare, e-commerce, affiliates, finance, and um, many more. And so, you know, for example, I, I don't typically do e-commerce anymore, but I have experience with it. If it was, you know, a, um, a low level or, you know, easy level of e-commerce. Um, but I would definitely not take a couple of e-commerce clients at the same time. Because there are people that specialize in that, yeah. that I would, you know, want to um, refer them to. So I look at, um, I mean, just like that answer of it depends. I would look at, you know, um, what kind of time commitment it was, um, what the what the industry is, how does it fit into like my, you know, my portfolio, my time, my effort, you know, at what um, what sorts of things do I need to uh, brush up on for that business. So like right now I have a lot of B2B clients and, um, it's, I'm loving it. It's great. So, I mean, again, I, I've had a, a really great variety of, of, uh, different guests of, of, uh, you know, different, different in different locations and everything else, but there seems to be kind of one common theme that a lot of them are coming, coming through with. Right. And that's that, you know, they're, they're kind of, current position in, in the industry is very much a kind of like a lifestyle choice rather than it being, uh, you know, you've got to set up an agency and you've got to grow it to like 500 people and, you know, make it huge and flip it and, you know, make millions and millions of dollars. They're very comfortable to be able to kind of choose what their lifestyle um, requirements are both from a sort of family perspective, work perspective, you know, how much time they want to spend working versus, you know, socializing with family, exercising that type of thing. Right. I mean, again, I always say I run a boutique agency. It's small by design, right? I could make it much bigger if I really wanted to, right? But I'm, I'm not after chasing big dollars. That's just not my thing. It's, it, you know, I'm happy to kind of work with people if that's what they were, what they're, uh, aim is what they're trying to do. I like, again, I call myself a growth agency. So it, people go, well, how can you call yourself a grow, growth agency if you're not growing yourself? Right. It's like, well, that's purposeful on my part. I don't want to grow. Right? I'm comfortable to be small because then that way I can give the clients I do work with like a, a great sort of a greater amount of my time and effort and energy, right. And expertise rather than, you know, get it, getting it very diluted and bringing in junior people to help sort of manage certain aspects of things and maybe not necessarily doing as good a job as, as you want to. Um, how did you, how did you kind of like, um, decide with big Clicko kind of what, what your lifestyle journey would look like in terms of where you are now, um, uh, versus maybe what, what it was at the beginning, like when you first set, set it up, I mean, you know, what, what was the reason for set, setting up big Clicko in the first place, leaving kind of maybe corporate, corporate jobs to kind of work and set up, set up on your own? Right. Oh, leaving corporate jobs. I think that uh, the the, cor the the corporate job part is about reaping the rewards of my hard work for you know for myself instead of benefiting um, nameless, faceless corporations was sort of my thinking at the time. Um, you said something. You said something really interesting about growing, uh, growing yourself and growing the agency, and why wouldn't you want to do that? I've heard that. A 
many times. And I think growing yourself and growing your agency can be two different things. Those are, those are things that can coexist, but you should, I, in my opinion, I, I don't want to grow my agency or grow my business to the point where I'm sacrificing my own personal growth. Sometimes that personal growth is about my business because I, you know, I'm, I'm a nerd. I love this kind of stuff. I like, I like work in business. It's one of my hobbies in my career, but I also like yoga. I like spending time with my family. I like traveling. And those are things that I don't want to sacrifice, um, in the pursuit of, um, uh, I guess making more money or, you know, like you were saying, and I think I'm really happy that, um, the way things have been sort of turning in our culture lately, in, it's more in alignment with what I've been thinking the whole time. I think that, um, you know, with COVID and with the increased cases of burnout, and I think all of those things were contributing factors to people being more open to flexible schedules, uh, work from home, work life balance, um, mental health considerations. Uh, all of those things I think have really um, come into alignment for me personally. And I think, and hopefully for, you know, everyone else and um, people entering the industry, because if you don't have that kind of personal satisfaction, you really can't be good at your job. You're just going to burn out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, like, so, so pre COVID, um, I mean, I probably spent three months of the year traveling, right. To, to kind of, right. but traveling, not, not traveling kind of for, for personal reasons, but traveling for work, right. I would go and visit clients, right. You know, so I work in, I live in the UK, but I had a lot of clients in America, clients in Australia. So I would like just travel and see my clients, right. Which again, sounds very whimsical, right. But, um, but I felt we could kind of like one, establish a much stronger bond to get more work done right. By doing that, um, you know, and, and it worked for me. So again, I, ha I had the, the sort of the home environment to kind of enable me to, to do some of that. A lot of the times my wife would travel with me. Right. So we didn't have to kind of worry. We, kids are grown up, left home. Fine. Um, you know, so I, I was in a position to be able to kind of do that. Right. So, um, but you know, and then obviously when we, we kind of had the pandemic, everything kind of shut down and I found it very difficult. Right. I mean, again, I think, I think, I wouldn't necessarily say I struggled with mental health issues, but I definitely, it, it was something I became more aware of, right? There was, there was, you know, a couple of people that we, we probably both all know in, in the industry who decided that they, they kind of wanted to check out on life, right? And, and took their own lives, which again, for me is tragic that, that, you know, that people who worked at home in an, in a, in an industry that, you know, again, it, it, it sort of, it, permeates people that, that are introverted becoming even more introverted, right? Um, and sometimes that that attending conferences was the only way, right, where you could kind of like rekindle your enthusiasm for for kind of like interaction with other people, right? I mean, again, it's very difficult. You, you know, you can sit in an office all day at home and not see anyone, um, you know, and I think you need to have that interaction with other people, right? So again, I always kind of, um, I, I find myself now, like going out and maybe grabbing a cup of coffee. I'll go out and have a walk, grab a cup of, cup of coffee and a takeaway cup, you know, have a walk home. And then that's given me some fresh air, some headspace, listen to a bit of music or a podcast episode, um, you know, get a bit of caffeine in me. Um, but, but, you know, talk to some people and just sort of see what's going on. Right. So again, people probably sitting at the coffee shop going, who's this weirdo? He keeps talking to me. Right. But, uh, you know, but I, again, I, I think it's, it's, is important to be personable, right. To kind of just put yourself out there. Um, you know, and yeah, I mean, I, I just, I, I didn't know how things were for you now. I know that you used to do a lot of speaking before. Have you sort of picked up the speaking mantle again and doing a lot more of it now, or is it sort of, have you, have you changed as a result of the pandemic as well? Well, I really, th I thought about what is it that I want to do what, what do I feel like doing? What makes, you know, what will bring joy to me? And some of the other things that I'm working on right now with um, 
uh, doing, doing more writing and I'm looking at how to take my content and repurpose it into, you know, video or audio learning more about AI. Um, I'm really enjoying that right now, um, because it's a, it's a new challenge and I have been, I have spoke before, you know, I have done those things and I'm not saying I won't again. I definitely want to. Um, I did some, um, not last year, but the previous year, I um, spoke at um, AdWorld Experience in Bologna, Italy, and also at SearchY in Paris. Nice. And yes, it was nice. And I thought, you know what? This is fantastic. Like how, you know, how do you beat this? And um, so... Yeah. So no, it's not, it's definitely not off the table, but it's not something I'm pursuing right now. I I, I think a lot of people make the mistake, right? They, they, they don't send people that work for them to conferences, right? Because they go, oh, we can't afford to kind of send people. Right. And they don't speak at the conferences because they go, well, I'm not picking up any new clients and so on and so on. Uh, I mean, I know when I used to sort of speak a long time ago, when I first started doing it, I mean, it was literally like shooting fish in a barrel. You you would kind of stand on stage, present some mind-blowing stuff about PPC, and people go, this is just mind-blowing. And they would come up afterwards and, and want to work with you, right? And I'd have a queue of people that would want to work with me. And it was great. And and I could, like I said, cherry pick which clients I wanted to work with. Um, and, and I think what's happened now is the industry's matured. It's become more developed. I think what tended to happen before, it was decision makers and budget holders that used to sit in the audiences themselves. What they now do is they maybe send, you know, junior people to learn, right? So those people are not budget holders and decision makers. So they're there to be educated, right? And I think a lot of speakers, they're still looking for the the kind of the, the leads and the sales to come from it, right? And they're not coming from that, right? Because I think a lot of those people maybe are working in-house and so on. Um, so again, I, I, I kind of go now, if, if I'm speaking at a conference, I want to make sure that whoever is in that audience is going to get, so let's say the tickets are 1500 bucks for a ticket, right? So it's 1500 bucks for the actual conference, maybe another 1500 to two grand for travel, accommodation, incidentals, beers in the bar, that type of thing. Um, you know, so you might be looking at sort of three to $5,000 worth of expense of being there plus the time away from the office, right? Um, even if they work from home, it's still time away from kind of the, their normal job. Um, and I always say to people, if I'm presenting on stage, I want to give them three to $5,000 worth of value just from my presentation alone. So they can kind of go away and go, yeah, I got some great takeaways that will be, you know, incremental revenue wise for us as a business to make it mm-hmm. to, to almost like to justify it. Right. I hate it. I mean, again, I, I don't know about you. I've sat, I, I went to a, a conference last week and, um, and I spoke but there were still loads of people when I, I, you know, when I wasn't on the stage, um, you know, speaking, I was supporting other people that were presenting and watch them speak. But there was all these people in the corridors, right, doing work on their laptops, sitting down the side, right? And I'm thinking, why are you, why are you even here at this conference, right? If if you're just doing your normal job, right? You, you again, it's I, I just think they're missing the point of what that in-person interaction is all about, right? I met some great people, right, in the affiliate space. Um, you know, I picked up some new podcast podcast guests. I picked up some new speaking engagements, right? So for me, it's it's again, I, I kind of put myself out there, uh, but I was there also as a, as a speaker supporting other speakers, right? And um, I think that's probably one thing if I could give anyone a advice or, or tips if they're going to speak at a conference don't just go for the bit that you're involved with go for the whole event mm-hmm. right and support all the other speakers that are there right because they're they're uh they're relying on feedback from you know people that will give them candid you know hey i thought that was great hey i think you could have done it better in a different way right because it's only by doing that that that, that will help bring bring about a kind of a positive change Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I used to do that as much as I could, as much as I could. If <laughs> Up until the presentation, I was still working on it. But after that, it was like, hmm. so um, that I, then the fun would begin. But um, I think, yeah, I think that's, I think that's really interesting. I mean, I think also 
Um, 10 years ago, I think we were more dependent on the information that we could get from the conferences, that it was more limited to that sort of a venue. And then again, um, you know, sorry to bring up COVID, but I think, you know, that really forced people to find alternate ways to present information like this, you know, like this video podcast that we're on right now. Um, the number of webinars that, you know, video meetings are the, are the, are common in the norm. It wasn't 10 years ago at all. It would be sort of like, Oh, you want to meet on camera? Why? <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's, so I think it's really interesting. Things have changed a lot where that information is available in so many different formats. So I feel like the the conferences are a much play a much smaller role in people's uh, continuing education. But the you know the but the personal interaction is you know definitely very important, and um, you know maybe some of the junior level people that are going just you know don't really. I don't know, maybe they don't really appreciate it. Maybe they're just not that into it. You know, maybe it's, you know, less of a passion and more of a job. Yeah. So, I mean, but I would encourage people that um, go to conferences um, to max out on their opportunities. You know, um, it does not hurt to, you know, get your included lunch and snacks and strike up a conversation with people around you. Yeah. Say hi to the speakers, give them feedback. And um, definitely for speakers, I mean, yeah, I'm, I would always like be dialed in. I wish I could have gone to all of them because I wanted to learn. I felt like I was getting a bonus. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. I, I you know, that there are people that go to, to, uh, to events. So again, this, this event that I was at was an affiliate event and I was primarily talking about e-commerce uh, for affiliate marketing, right? Which fine. It's a subject I know pretty well. And I, I got, I feel I gave some good content, right? But there were some other people talking about compliance. There were some other people talking about AI and there was other people talking about all sorts of different things that I'm really interested in, you know, as a, ca as a casual observer, right? Not necessarily I'm in market for any tools or whatever, but again, it's just good to understand how other people are looking at a particular thing and what challenges and, and opportunities um, and threats that it throws up, right? So, you know, again, if you've got somebody that, that is, you know, really, really deep in the weeds with AI, right? It's like, it, it, it seems far, far more sensible to just be able to sit and watch somebody talk about it at great length, right? And, um, you know, and, and, and obviously you can then pick up a lot from that, right? So, you know, again, I've, I've now uh, got a couple of people that I watch present that I'm going to try and get on as podcast guests, right? Because again, I think they've got uh, industry knowledge that I think would be of immense value to people who are either in the industry now or looking to break into the industry, uh, both on a sort of male and female side, right? I mean, again, I, I, um, I've tried purposefully to help promote, um, you know, uh, digital marketing as, a, as a, a female kind of career, right? Because there's no physical attributes you need to do the job, right? You don't need to like have big muscles or great strength or anything like that. You just need a good brain, right? And I just think generally speaking, you know, women have a, a greater brain than men do for, for this type of thing. So, so for me, again, I, I've got, um, you know, two, two stepdaughters that work in the industry, right? I've, I've been sort of really promoting and helping them kind of as best I can. Um, and again, I, I try and do whatever I can to help promote um, the awareness of, you know, this being a cool industry to work in if you're a woman, right? Because, you know, it is. I think, you know, all the people I know that, that are, have been doing it for, for a long time, people like yourself, you know, have done very well with it. And I think they've they've set the, um, you know, the benchmark for what this industry will look like in years to come. And we decide we're not going to, you know, we're going to call, call it a day and put our feet up and sit on a rocking chair on the porch. I mean, that that's, you know, uh, we can kind of say, well, we did, we did good work, we did good work and we did well and we've kind of handed it off and, and left it in good shape. I think it's one of those jobs and one of those careers where you can make it what you want to make it. And, um, we could have this, someone who does this same job basically be in two different locations, have different types of clients, um, have slightly different experiences. We're not the same. It's like when you work on an account, you could have two accounts in, um, in finance, they will not be the same. It doesn't matter. They could do exactly the same thing. They will not be the same. So you, there's so much, there's so much variety 
um, even with all the similarities. And you can make it whatever you can make it whatever you want. You can get out of it um, not only what you put into it, but what you want. If you're more on the creative side, you can you can go crazy with that. If you're more into the analytics, and you know there are lots of experts that are a lot more into analytics, they're into data, they're they're more into the numbers side than I am. So, you know, I just, I'm like kind of, you know, I'm listening, listening and learning from them. And you just, I mean, you can take it in a lot of different directions. And I think, um, you know, that's, that it fits with so many different types of people. Yeah. And that, and like, it, and, and that's one of the reasons why if I go to a conference, like if there's, you know, I mean, I know you can't be in all the places at one time. Right. But, you know, if you, go to the show and there's three sessions and then a break, three sessions and then a break, lunch, and then, a, you know, three more sessions or whatever. I make absolutely sure I kind of go, right, if there's, you know, let's say there's competing things, I'll go, right, I'll go to that one and that one and that one and that one. And, then, and I've kind of like laid out my my agenda of things, right? Again, as, as much as anything, sometimes I'm there to support friends who are speaking. Some of them are speaking for the first time. They're very nervous, right? So I... I I try and do what I can to kind of help calm the nerves and, you know, go through the presentation a few times with them, right? Again, generally speaking, if they're good subject matter experts, which they all are to kind of be on the stage, then, you know, you know, it's going to go well, right? Even if their delivery is not so good, if, as long as the content's as, as good as it could be, and, and generally it is. But equally, you know, like I said, it, to, to your point about like things like analytics, I've got a Rolodex full of the best people in whatever it might be, whether it's technical SEO, black hat SEO, you know, link building, whatever it might be. I mean, I don't do um, organic search other than, you know, for, for a kind of comparatively small number of clients, I kind of do a little bit here and there. But again, it's I, I would almost kind, kind of class it as sort of almost like a hygienic stuff rather than anything kind of far more complicated than that, right? But, but I think, um, you know, if somebody has a problem with, you know, getting manual penalties or something. I know who to, I knew who to call. I know what to do yes. to kind of facilitate mm -hmm. getting that sorted out. Same with analytics. So when we have an analytics problem, I know people that are amazing. I mean, I'm reasonably good at um, things like uh, GA4 and data studio, right. But there are people that are way, way better than me, yeah. right? right. That if, if the, if the kind of challenge exists, then I can kind of pick up the phone and say, look, you know, this, this, companies looking for help. And I think you'd be the perfect person to kind of do, to provide that help. Right. So, you know, and, and again, I, I just think it's sort of, um, having, having watched those people present, I'm speaking from a, with a degree of confidence to know that they're not completely full of shit. Right. I know that they know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. D yeah, definitely. It's, um, yeah. Building that network is important because there will be a time in your career that something comes up that you are not the expert on you may not know anything about it there's there, i had to um i had to refresh myself on grants um yeah. a couple of weeks ago what google just had google a, government had, grant right. yeah, yeah i just hadn't had to touch it for a while so i had to refresh myself on it yeah um, luckily I could refresh myself, but you will come up with things like that where you're like, I got to call a grant someone I know who does that yeah. so they can, um, you know, help me out with that. But, um, yeah, those are, that's, um, that's great. I mean, you also have a thirst for knowledge. So, um, I think I, I've seen you do, uh, seen you on different, different webinars and different sorts of things out in the industry over the years. So again, um, I'm, I'm doing that because I want to give back. Right. I mean, like, again, probably sounds blase, but the industry has been really good to me. You know, I've made some great friends. I've done really well, made decent money. Right. I've been comfortable. Right. But I just, I just want to give back. I want to try and, and sort of help the, the next generation. Right. That's, that's really the kind of the ethos behind it all. Right. So, you know, the way you can kind of do that is impart your knowledge. I mean, sometimes people go, I don't want to, you know, Hey, granddad, shut up, get out of the way, you know, just let us young kids get on with it, right? And again, I I, I know my kind of playground, but the areas I'm kind of comfortable with. I mean, you know, um, with, with this podcast, I mean, I create a video episode, I then chop it up using some AI tools that I have access to, right, to enable me to put it out on TikTok and to put it out on, you know, like YouTube shorts and things like that, right? It's taking me dramatically outside my comfort zone, but it's also giving me good skills to understand 
the kind of like the concepts of how it works, right? Because I want to, I want to kind of in, I want to be able to say with confidence with clients that I work with whether TikTok ads or YouTube short ads would be a good proposition for them to run with, right? And the only way I can kind of do that is if I understand a little bit more about how how it all works. I mean, I think when when TikTok came out, I'm like, you know, unless you unless you're a kind of like a fashion or or retail company. Um, that, that your target audience is 18 to 25 year old women, then TikTok's probably not the platform for you. But I think if you look at it, it's evolved a lot in the last couple of years, right? Probably since the pandemic, right? It's, it's changed quite dramatically, right? Um, but I, I also think there are TikTok ads specialists who are nowhere near as good as the people that do PPC, like Google ads, Microsoft, and so on, pay social, right? And they're, they're almost like they're winging it on TikTok, right? Because when you actually, when I've looked at some of the the kind of the back ends and the, I've audited some of the accounts that I've seen, right? I'm like, wow, this is, this is horrible. The kind of the way they've got it set up in terms of the configuration and the splitting up of products and that sort of thing. Um, you know, but I, I, at the same time, I'm not comfortable enough with TikTok to be able to say, yeah, let's kind of go and, and offer it as a service, right? So I'm, at the moment, I'm kind of like, casually observing rather than actually actively kind of getting involved in it. But that, that may change. Right. So have you done have you have you done any research into Reddit? Um I, I've Reddit. done a little bit. Reddit. I've done a little bit, but again, not not too much. I mean, you know, it used to be that whenever a new platform came out, I would go, right, I'm just gonna throw a thousand dollars at it and see what happens, right? I'd pick a client get them to commit to a thousand dollars, throw it, throw it at the wall and see what happens. Right. And, um, and I think Reddit's probably one of those, I should have done something with it, but I just haven't. I mean, I definitely did core ads, TikTok, Snapchat. Um, you know, there's lots of things I've, I've tried and some of it has been more successful than others. Um, mm -hmm. you know, but again, in the same way that I've kind of uh, refined my service offering in terms of the clients I want to work with. Right. Um, you know, I've also done the same thing. I, I kind of, I said, I don't want to be a jet as much as I'm a generalist, as in I'll do lots of different channels. I'll do the ones that I think really kind of make a difference. Right. I think, you know, again, we might get incrementally one or 2% incremental uplift from TikTok, right. Or Snapchat or whatever it might be, but it still takes us a, a significant amount of time to actually do the work to get things prepared for that. Right. Because to your point that you mentioned earlier before about things like cookies, right? So it's like, you got to get the cookie, the, the, the pixels in place and all the events and all the tracking and all the parameters and all that sort of back end stuff, right? Which if you don't do it properly, right, then, you know, you're literally shooting arrows over a wall and hoping that one of them hits the target when it lands on the ground, right? And that's no way to run a business. Uh, but unfortunately, I think a lot of people, that's the way they do run a business. When, you know, when you look at... Um, you know, B2B, I mean, I, again, I think with, with B2B stuff, right, and you can probably talk to this, but I think a lot of people, they, they kind of set up the conversion events, right, but they don't actually, I mean, again, as much as people say, I want leads, they don't really want leads. They want quality leads that turn into, right. into sales or, or whatever. So, you know, and, and I think that's where that feedback loop of the, the kind of the enhanced conversions and like feeding back the information to Google to say, hey, this, this actually was a decent one. We got got something more out of it than just a lead, right? That's a signal that their AI can, can learn from, um, you know, but I think a lot of people are not doing that kind of close, they're not closing the loop, right? They may be generating leads at $10, $5, whatever the number is, right? But it's like, again, as we know, there are publishers out there, nefarious publishers that will, you know, fake leads to kind of make more of the traffic go to them rather than to other publishers, right? So, you know, if, if you don't, if you're not doing quality control, then you could end up getting hurt really badly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so, so in, in terms of, again, so, so on the subject of AI, right. So mm -hmm. I think, I think when you look at the last couple of years, you know, AI has become a really big thing, right. I think Google have adopted it massively. Microsoft have adopted it massively. Facebook have adopted it massively. Right. And as a result of it, I think a lot of the controls that, that, you know, experts like us used to kind of do, right, to get the good results that we got have been almost like dumbed down to enable the AI to kind of do 
a mediocre job for everyone rather than the really good job for someone. <laughs> and that's a good job for I love that. I love so, that. A mediocre job for everyone. Yay. <laughs> but I, I just didn't know, I, I wasn't sure kind of what your thoughts were because, you know, like, Again, I know, I know some people have got, they've gone all in on the whole AI that the Google does and they'll accept every recommendation that they come up with. Um, you know, but I, I'm, I'm sort of a little bit more selective. I'm kind of more selective about the things that I'll adopt and the things that I won't adopt. Um, right. I think, I think, um, so in my experience, a lot of the, many of the recommendations are not very good. So I'll get a couple a couple or a couple I could work with. Yeah. It's, it's the, it's the minority of the recommendations. And actually I'm really excited when I get them, I'll say, all right, now I have something I can work with. That is valuable. Thank you. But it's not often. So, um, I think the other thing, and I wrote, um, I wrote some posts about this is the different things that you need to get in place to be AI ready in your campaigns which is having, um, you know, certain bidding, bidding settings, um, uh, various different settings. I can't, there's so many like little buttons that you have to push. And one of the, one of the, um, the major things that I don't, people don't think people realize is that they're, they're also taking content from your landing pages. And this, this concerns me the most of all, because any most companies, small to medium size, I mean, basically any size company, right? They're not a hundred percent on their website. A hundred percent. Um, uh, right. A hundred percent up to date, a hundred percent, uh, perfect, a perfect website. So then we have this content that might be outdated. That is imperfect. That's flawed. And Google's taking that and putting that into the ads and I don't think they realize that's where it's coming from. It's it's not coming from the AI thinking it up. It's coming from their website and from other things they have entered in. So that's really interesting. So is that really AI? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think I think the pr the problem is is that you know so sometimes the the AI builds on like really crap stuff to begin with. Right. Right. And, you know, as you say, like, I mean, I, I, I've got a, a client who um, I, I do sort of B2B lead gen for. So even though they're, they're like my core business is e-commerce, I mean, this is, a again, lo absolutely love the client. Right. But they're, they're doing B2B lead gen. When I kind of first sort of logged into their WordPress account to have a look at the kind of the back end to get all the tracking working and all that sort of stuff, I looked at they had a sort of a, a testimonial plugin that they kind of downloaded from the WordPress kind of repository. Um, and I looked and they had like five or six basically boilerplate testimonials set up in there, right? I think it's kind of like, you know, if you wanted like lorem ipsum kind of type of thing, but they had them for, for testimonials. And one of the testimonials was, was from somebody called Brad Pitt, right? And I'm thinking, <laughs> and, you know, and it was oh, obviously com a completely bogus testimonial, right? But because the previous agency had not kind of done their homework and made sure that everything was hygiened and cleaned up, right? This this page was live and on their site. Like, this is crazy. I mean, you know, um, again, I don't think it added any value to their their business. I don't think it was detrimental because it was a small business. But you know, that sort of thing could have been really damaging, right? And and also, it's like, well, if they're if Google is going to go, right, I'm going to go out and try and find more customers like the one they've got, like Brad Pitt, right? And sort of like, <laughs> right. You know, and I, I think, yeah, for, for B2B, they, I mean, the, at least the clients I have a lot, um, many of them have complex products. So what I'll see the AI from Google ads and Microsoft ads is something more generic. And that just, we can't use that. We can't use something more generic because a lot of times, a lot of times like the, uh, the more generic things will be, uh, start, start to fall into like the consumer side, you know, where it will pick up those types of searches and those type, that type of messaging. Yeah. So it doesn't really have the, it doesn't have the ability to do that. So, I mean, the bottom line is you, you know, you still need humans, um, you know, to inform the AI and to, um, 
you know, to pick and choose what's good out of it. What I have been having really good luck with is getting um, seed ideas, um, processes, lists of stuff. Yeah. Um, that has saved me a ton of time in research um, where that's pretty easy for AI to do. So that's what I've been having um, really good experience with. Um, I also I also built my own um, GDP GPT, and um, and um, put in customizations to um, think like me. It, so I've been using that. Yeah, and I think I think uh, you know I think that's where um, it's important that you try to educate it to be like you, right? So again, like use more examples of your own stuff, right? Your own content. So if you get, if you've written a whole bunch of LinkedIn posts, you don't want to write the LinkedIn posts using chat GPT. Um, and it makes you sound like somebody, something or somebody that you're not right. Because again, I think people, w- people will really resonate with authenticity, right? And if, if you're not u- uniquely yourself, right, then they're going to go, well, this isn't, you know, that, that, the person that is reflected on the, the the page is not the person that's reflected in real life, right? So, and I know that obviously there's a whole bunch of ghostwriters out there that are probably coining it like right now. I mean, there's probably loads of people that are using ChatGPT to pretend to be somebody else, right? Passing themselves yeah, yeah. off as ghostwriters for people, but really all they've just done is they've been good at understanding how to write prompts for GPT, so. Mm-hmm. Yes. So Lisa, we could probably sit and talk for like three hours, right? But um, oh wow, I just right didn't notice the time. I don't, I don't, I don't want to, you know, like I, I always find sometimes it's good to kind of keep the episodes to to be, you know, enough that people could have a lunch break or a, a, a kind of like a, a reasonably comfortable uh, walk if they're out with headphones on. Um, so I wanted to kind of thank you for for being a, a fantastic guest with me today. Um, hopefully, at some point in time, we get the opportunity to kind of see each other again in 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 future, a, a future event, if you decide to kind of put yourself back on the speaker circuit. Um, it just remains for me to say, like I said, thank you so much for, for being on. Um, is there anything in particular that, that, you know, you want to kind of like convey with the guests, or sorry, the, um, the, the listeners or, or viewers of the podcast as to, you know, something that you have as an offer or something that you kind of want to promote that you're involved in? Well, if someone wants to get a hold of me, they can go to my website, bigclickco.com, or they could look me up on LinkedIn and um, get a hold of me there, uh, friend me, <laughs> connect in there. Um, I also um, have a newsletter that I've been working on called the Paid Media Mix on LinkedIn, and um, I've been really having fun with that. And um uh, being able to publish topics that I'm interested in. Um, but I have some uh, awesome and detailed articles on Search Engine Journal that uh, people might be interested in, including one about AI that's uh, pretty recent. So, And I'll make sure that all of the, the stuff that we've talked about in the show itself and also the stuff that you just mentioned now will be in the show notes and available um, on the website for people to kind of go and uh, access at their, at their leisure. Uh, Lisa, thanks again for, for being a fantastic guest. Uh, for everyone else, um, you know, that, that's been sort of watching watching or listening, thanks so much for, for being on. Uh, see you on the next episode of Bad Decisions with Jim Banks and uh, take care. Bye for now. Thank you.